Bloodborne, a graphical, compositional, and storytelling masterpiece of media, is a generational game, yet also just another tick in the long line of From Software's exceptional Soul series. And not to kill the buzz, but while there will never be a sequel, the standalone Born in the Soulsborne catalog is one of the best games I've ever played, and we've been looking forward to this video for a long time, so I'll cut the wait. Let's get straight into it with number 40. If there's one boss in this game that sticks out like a sore thumb for suckage, it's the one reborn. I always try to be fair with at least one positive per boss, no matter how terrible it is, and you know what? The one reborn does have a cool nod to the Tower Knight from Demon's Souls. Yeah, except for the fact that you're just as vulnerable up top trying to prevent him from being buffed to oblivion as you are in the main area. At least with the Tower Knight you were unhittable, and the archers didn't even have that major of a role in the fight either way, while on the contrary, the Chime Maidens are a necessary kill, they love to spawn in fireballs, and they can heal the damn thing, as if he needs it, his health bar is gargantuan for a fight this early. The One Reborn is, and I quote, a colossal colonized undead mass. Now, if that doesn't sound like a shitty boss, then... Well, fair point, it does sound kinda cool, but the undead mass part is a real kick in the nuts. Said undead mass makes up for the worst move in any game I have ever played, and shout out Fextra Life, I'm quoting them again, the flailing corpses move. And I quote, All limbs in the body of the one reborn start furiously kicking and swiping in all directions, literally every limb on its body flails. And if you get caught in a bad spot during the animation, plain and simply, you're dead. Try and quick step out, take double damage, do nothing, yeah, you're also dead. Try and pop a blood vial. I bet your sweet ass you didn't even know blood vial counter damage was a thing. Well, it is. Enjoy the minute long sprint through hell to get back here. Your only hope of coming out victorious is to pop some bolt paper and go for his torso, or rather, leg infested centerpiece that after a while will prompt the main body to come crashing down for a visceral. All of this while avoiding random, untelegraphed spurg attacks that push you off and once again can stun lock if you get unlucky. Oh, by the way, did I mention it's raining bodies? No? Well, it's raining bodies. Throughout the whole fight, the One Reborn randomly spawns in limbs that are absurdly high damage, and like everything here, there's no real tells. A Blood Moon spawns above you, and a quick second later, an ex-human being's limb comes crashing down on your dome. Let's keep on going? Sure. I'm assuming you don't like the acid diarrhea that's fairly common in Souls, and lucky you. Of course the One Reborn craps out Corrosive Dookie all over the arena with zero warning, and if you get caught, you are good as screwed. I, I, I'm done. I don't know what to say. I hate this boss a lot. I'm done. Let's just move on. One weird thing I noticed is that despite loving Bloodborne, I would say that I vehemently hate nearly half the bosses in the game. And even among all the other miserable garbage this game spews at you, Rom the Vacuous Spider is just barely above the One Reborn. This fight is absolutely bewildering to me from a design perspective. If any one of the multitude of things terribly wrong with this fight were removed, it would at least be mediocre. But as it is, it is an abominable failure at crafting anything resembling competent boss design. Crafting is putting it generously, a more fitting word might be cobbled. For one, he starts off every single phase with a new batch of mini spiders. Unlike those in the vastly superior Duke's Dear Freya fight, these guys are aggressive heavy hitters with armored heads. Yeah, that's another kicker. You can't even quickly dispose of his endless hordes. You gotta personally address every single spider in the room by strafing around them, hitting them twice, and then moving on. Of course you can try to ignore the spiders, and it's, it's doable, I can attest to that, but it is simply not a reliable option. They can often kill you in two hits, sending you all the way back to the Bergenworth lamp. Anytime you enter this fight, you're given a clear dilemma. Option 1, you can either spend minutes upon minutes clearing the room, whacking Rom, clearing his goons again, but this time with him pissing magic icebergs out of the sky and air and so on, or option 2, you can attack him directly, but the chances are you'll get one or two shot by his lackeys thanks to counter damage before you can even put a dent in his health bar. This is of course made even worse by the weapon degradation they deal out. I already think needing to repair weapons is a stupid, pointless mechanic, but having to go back to the hunter's dream to do it every few deaths is just rubbing salt in the wound. The only thing I can respect about this boss is the honesty. It is definitely vacuous. The Thumerian Descendant is beyond the saying too quick. It feels like he was made to force roll spam, but in turn, he's so fast he catches the roll. 
I mean, he also doesn't have anything notable about him, so even at a slower speed, he'd be nothing more than fine, except he's not. The fight's like a tango with one ugly motherfucker on bath salts. He gives no reprieve and literally does not stop swinging. Which makes you think, just parry him. Sounds doable, excusing the fact that he basically dodges 90% of your shots or you just plain mess up a bunch because his swings are crap levels of swift. If you land a shot, be warned he has a visceral recovery slash, which is just textbook bullshit. Otherwise, the attack will consist of swings, left swings, right swings, charge swings, the list goes on. At around half health, he splits his blade in two. So yeah, not only is he still just as fast, he now has double the attack length and damage. Think of this phase like Orphan of Cost Phase 2 without the fun. If you thought the first phase was spammy, well, I don't have much to say. It's worse, trust me. As unenjoyable and crappy as they come, the Thumerian Descendant is wet, hot, trash. It's Dark Beast Parl, but with more health and a new name. Parl is already pretty terrible, but now you have to deal with his spastic skittering and untrackable movement for much longer. That might not sound so bad in words, so let me make an analogy here. For a hundred bucks, would you put your hand over an open flame for one second? You probably would, right? Like, it might hurt a bit, but in the end it's worth it. Well, what if I told you you had to do it for a full minute? You might be a bit more hesitant. That's pretty much the idea behind this guy. He's got ridiculously hardcore endgame stats because he's found in the Chalice Dungeons, which are themselves a mechanic I cannot even put to words my immeasurable dying hatred for. Suffering hours upon hours just to fight this insulting reskin is soul crushing. Just try to cripple his legs over and over and keep him out of his electric mode and you'll eventually come out on top. The palpable laziness and guaranteed frustration in this fight ensure it a spot in the dregs of our list. You know, I actually used to like the Budstark Beast a decent amount, but on my third playthrough I've come to realize there is zero enjoyment to tag along with the words Bloodstarved Beast. It's like they saw a checklist of everything the player base hates in a boss fight and meshed it into one, but as a constellation made him look cool. Yeah, he looks cool, I really like his flappy hood, or whatever it is, but that's about it. The entirety of Old Yarnum is extremely difficult for the beginner Souls player, so to have a half at not even half-ass, like quarter-ass boss on top is good ol' insult to injury, and I say quarter-ass simply because every single one of his attacks are generically lame and universally crap. Also, I fought him like six times thanks to my chalice runs, and I still can't parry him if there was a gun to my head. He's a beast, he swings his claws, but for some reason or another, his flappy foreskin makes it almost impossible to time it right. Oh yeah, and he farts out poison and inflicts basically frenzy but sedatable with the use of sedatives found throughout the preceding area, so let's end it right there on a positive note. There's items in an area you can use in a boss fight. The Bloodstarved Beast. Bone wheels have nothing on these bastards. Brain suckers are the most annoying enemy in any game I've played hands down. Nothing makes me scream in rage like losing my hard earned insight to these stupid squid head motherfuckers. He's easy as a boss so at least you aren't going to get stuck on this fight or anything, but it's still incredibly frustrating being caught in the long boring animations again and again. I don't have much to say on the mechanics beyond conveying intense burning anger. The brain sucker has to have been made to disgruntle people because I can't imagine any other purpose to this boss. Yeah, I have nothing to say, you fist a pig up his asshole. I already talked about the Loran Dark Beast. This guy gets spared some flack because you probably only fight him for like 30 seconds unless you're one of the crazies who fights him early for some reason. He just scampers around and takes swipes at you with the occasional AoE attack. It's not that hard to roll through the AoE, so that's probably the best time to damage him. Overall, still pretty cruddy, but he's not hard enough to merit such frustration in my opinion. Well, this is a placement I heavily disagree with. I'll do my part and stick to pessimism, but do know beforehand this is not my actual resolve. Also, for those of you questioning why we didn't even out, I'll address that and why some bosses are higher than both our personal placements. 
To keep it short, it's an easy fix to place them where they are. It already takes us quite the while to separate our differences, so sometimes we have to agree to disagree and place a boss in an easily resolved spot that in turn makes the rest of the list much more manageable to dissect. Anyways, the Headless Bloodletting Beast is much worse than his maggot nullified counterpart. For one, the Earthquake feels a lot more difficult to dodge, which is odd, as it's the same arena, timing and such, and as a matter of fact, the normal and headless versions actually share the same movesets for the most part. The headless does have a couple extra attacks that do suck pretty hard however, those being a blood colored call beyond and the actual maggot that pops out at half health and flicks rapid poison, which mixed with a heavy hitting pot shot or earthquake will probably kill ya. I'll reserve the rest of the commentary, which I won't have a ton of for the bloodletting beast, which I'll just give a quick spoiler is way higher on the list. As much as the headless bloodletting beast blows, especially as the subsequent boss after a depth 5 through Marion descendant, he's also the second to last boss of the Chalice Dungeon, so stick to it. These bozos combined make for one of the most eh bosses of all time. It's three pale fat dudes who awkwardly lumber towards you with various weapons. Parry him, spam him, or do anything, it'll work just fine. It's piss easy even for lesser skilled players. Nothing to say here besides that these are just one of many throwaway bosses of the Chalice Dungeons. The Laurent Silver Beast is just like any other main game Chalice Dungeon variant, it's the same enemy with a unique twist. Well, actually, I don't even think there is a twist, it's the exact same enemy with more health. I guess be careful of the torch and its chomp attacks when it drops on all fours. Otherwise, it's low health and serves as nothing more than a free lot of blood echoes. I don't really get how you're supposed to melee this guy. His chains are moving far longer than your iframes last, so any effort to get close to him is sure to end in a steel ball to the face. I can't think of anything else to say. He's annoying and otherwise unmemorable. He's just not hard enough to be as irritating as some of his peers. While not a chalice boss, I'm not exactly stacked to the ceiling with commentary on the Witches of Hemwick. It's not particularly bad, more so easy, lazy, and uninspired. Think of this fight as like a crappy game of hide and seek, the first and eventually second witch teleport once found and stay invisible until you get in their general vicinity. It's not too bad finding them considering their only spawn points are the corner, center of the room, or either staircase, which leads me to say I like the arena. It's pretty cool looking and makes handling the witches and mad ones much easier to deal with. You can also enter, quit out, blow your inside on like paper or something and come back to despawn the mad ones but as is they're so slow and honestly disinterested in killing you that it's not worth all the fuss. I actually died to the witches like 4 times on my first playthrough and felt totally incompetent considering all I heard was how these old geezers were the pinwheel of Bloodborne. Yeah, I do think they're easy but not like that easy. Their AoE does heavy damage for what's likely your 5th or 6th boss in the run, and the throat slit's a pretty monster attack. It alone was what killed me all 4 times. To be completely honest, this is one of my top 3 least favorite moves in a Souls game. They straight up freeze you like Yarnum and slice your throat, and considering how early on they are, it'll one shot you. So, the Witches of Hemwick are notable for their flaws and don't have a lot going for them. Do I think they're terrible? By no means, but at the same time they're nothing more than… maybe okay. These guys are just funny. Their most distinctive trait is their giant ridiculous blob heads, which makes it pretty hard to take them seriously. That said, in this case, looks aren't deceiving either, they really are that goofy. You can just slaughter them en masse with little to no difficulty in phase 1, and in phase 2 the only change is the main guy gets bigger. I personally find this boss sort of amusing, so I think he's more lame than bad, and at least he has sort of cool lore I guess. He's got enough comedic value to make it out of the garbage zone, but it's pretty lacking beyond that. The Beast Possessed Soul Genus Goofus Maximus is the butt of Bloodborne. It's an oxymoron in of itself in that it's a beast that uses pyromancy. It's also the dumbest looking boss of all time, and the animations are so janky by nature that I can't help but laugh every time I see it. In terms of movesets, all the soul does is swing at you or do weak fire magic. 
In fairness, the pyromancies look cool, but at the same time, the beast possessed soul is just another lame and monotonous chalice boss. It's the undead giant, but he's got a blade arm now. He's about as interesting as the others, but is probably the most basic of them all. You can whack away at his huge acne bumps to stagger him and get some licks in, which is much appreciated given you usually fight him sorta of early, as he's the first chalice boss for most. As long as you strafe well and don't get greedy, he's nothing too crazy. Make sure you've got a plus 3 weapon or above though, if you don't want the fight to last 10 minutes that is. Ironic as is, I forgot these guys existed. They're nerfed hunters with cooler attacks and better clothing options, so you can't exactly blame me either. I do like how they're both unique though. The Madman rocks an infused Ludwig's sword and Ludwig's rifle, while his escort's got a Kirk hammer and a flame sprayer. And on rare occasion, the Madman will go full Mikolash and tentacle foreplay with Augur of Abritas, and dare we not forget, the almighty Call Beyond. You can try and hide behind pillars or stay back even, but it won't matter if you're in close range, your good is dead. Also, it doesn't feel like a gank. The Forgotten Madman summons the Escort a bit after the halfway point, but he has such weak defense that you can probably stunlock him to death. If he does get out, it can be a bit of a nuisance to handle both. I'd say focus on the Madman, then the Escort should be tidy work. While simple, it's effective as both a mediocre filler and a decent time, so the very forgettable Forgotten Madman lives up to his mantle. This boss is a lot like one of those hunter NPCs you can find throughout the game, but isn't an impossible nightmare to kill. I'd take three of these guys at once over that insane Bergenworth hunter with the threaded cane. His main thing is fire, which he can fling around on occasion and eventually buff his sword with. It's not a major game changer when this happens, but he hits a little harder, so there's that to consider. His main weakness is his poise. You can slap this guy around all day with R1 spam. It's so easy it feels like bullying. The Keeper is just another chalice boss, really, but even in defiled form he's not so horrible, so he can keep a place here in the middle area. Yeah, I mean, we've already gone over it twice, except this time he's a lot more fun. In case you're illiterate or have no idea what's going on, this undead giant has a cannon that fires powerful shots, but it's at close range, so he's not exactly a sharpshooter. And this is also my favorite looking variant, so yeah. That's it. The living failures are like if the Celestial Emissary was a lot cooler. The general idea is the same, it's a bunch of members of the choir who got blobified into funny looking aliens, but at least this group puts up a basic effort to kill you. They have some normal swings that do a shockingly high amount of damage, as well as a really flashy comet attack they whip out around half health. This is easily avoided by standing on one side of the big middle structure every time, which is kind of disappointing. It'd be a lot more interesting if you had to actually dodge their big icebergs of arcane great one stuff to me. Either way, I still usually have fun with this fight. You can parry him if you wanna, but it's sorta tricky since they love to stop attacking and just have a guy off screen come up and whack you from behind. As a boss, this fight is basically the prelude to Lady Maria, so it's stuck playing second fiddle due to being directly followed by a much more noteworthy showdown. Retrospectively, this should have been lower. But at least Lawrence is memorable. In a good way? No, but memorable nonetheless. It's pretty crazy that the bare minimum to crack the top half of this list is to be creatively imaginative. Not even creative like cool creative, just original enough to be memorable. 20 of the 40 bosses in Bloodborne get beaten out because this flammable cleric beast reskin gets the blood pumping. Yeah, my first point, Lawrence is adrenaline cocaine. This is second on my all time list of most nervous I've ever been during a victorious encounter and I'm speaking about my first time beating him by the way. His reach and onslaught are second to none and he beats out the likes of a Britos in terms of counter damage. His attacks were purposefully designed to catch dodges via odd delays and have extensively elongated hitboxes and the small fire effects after certain attacks can stagger you back to the lamp. On an off note, Lawrence is probably the most important lore figure in the game. He founded the Healing Church and served as its first Viker, but before that he was one of the group of Bergenworth students along with Willem who discovered the Old Blood in the Chalice Dungeons. While he was advised not to mess with it, Lawrence took the risk and caved to the Scourge of the Beast and transformed into the monstrous flaming reskin we see him as today. 
Back to the fight, it's split into two phases. The first is pretty typical for the large beast. He has multi-move combos, but nothing out of the ordinary. My recommendation is to go for one leg at a time because you can break him and get a free visceral. This phase is much more difficult than the second, namely due to his recovery speed and reach. Unlike most bosses, for Lawrence, ankle biting does catch up however, at about 40% health his legs disintegrate and he crawls around using his arms. He bleeds out lava from his lower torso and it leaves behind a dangerously powerful trail so be wary to not get cornered or else you're likely dead. Like I've said like 3 times, this phase is a lot easier, namely due to weaker defense and smaller movesets on Lawrence's part and because he has no way of really guarding his sides. He can only move around his arms and he occasionally backs off by jumping, but generally he's not as aggressive and takes heavier blows. So overall, this fight is pretty bad. His stats are not fair and it was made to be impartially difficult. And while I dumbed it down, don't be fooled. This is one of the hardest fights in the series, which like I said, makes it memorable, but it's simply crap all the while. As the true final boss of Bloodborne, you'd guess he'd be a bit harder. I think most people were shocked by how little difficulty it takes to kill this great one, but I don't think it's pitiful enough to be outright boring. He's got a really neat looking design for one, and while it can be sorta of tricky to figure out what he's doing with all his tentacles in the way, it's never been a major problem that affects the quality of the fight for me. His most interesting attack is the one that takes all but a single point of your health and leaves himself wide open for rallying immediately afterwards. I'm a fan of this move because it's really satisfying getting your health back and hacking away at him for such a long time. He's got plenty of plot significance as well, he's the force that keeps poor Garman stuck as a cripple, although given his interest in the doll, maybe that's for the best. All in all, killing this master of the nightmare doesn't leave as big an impression as I think it should as the final boss, but I have enough fun with it that I'd still call it a solid fight. Like everyone else so far, Mikolash is once again leaning on the boring side, but he has slightly more going for him, giving him the upper hand on the rest so far, as in, I guess we're coming close to the decent category of boss fights. I wouldn't exactly call this a boss fight though, rather a boss escapade. Sure, for the first couple minutes or so, it is a pretty standard fight, with the exception of the small maze leading up to the library. Long story short, you duel him in a snuggly room for a group of four. I also forgot to mention there are two unkillable skeletal puppets that don't do a lot, but serve as good time wasters. In this phase, try to stay as close as possible to Mikolash, as even though that's a pretty unorthodox strategy for a boss, you want to limit his use of Augur of Abridus, one of the deadliest attacks in the game. Staying in his rack baits his AI into easily parryable and low damage punches, and if you force him into a corner, you can stunlock him for a bit until he squirms out. Per usual, around 50% he'll teleport away, and then begin the labyrinth. Somewhat depending on luck, but mostly map knowledge, this can last anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes, and at first his orcosms are pretty hilarious, but after the umpteenth time, it's a mental struggle. I'm not going to give the full rundown on the angles to approach him and the places you want to bait him into going, but it's not too confusing with a solid guide video. The second phase is pretty similar to the first, with one gigantic exception. Mikolash gains a call beyond. It's once again close quarters combat, so this really boils down to good fortune. He loves to use this attack, and I don't blame him. It's really fucking overpowered, so basically stay as close as possible and hope he doesn't pull a stun. We personally think Mikolash gets a bad rap. He's not well made or even decently made, but it's funny so a mid table spot is just fine. This boss is sort of interesting to me, as despite its story origins being fairly cryptic, the name is actually shared with a part of the brain, specifically the part that handles emotions and aggression control. This was obviously intentional by FromSoft, as the odds of them randomly choosing this name are astronomically low, and it implies that the amygdala is a being in some way related to intense emotion. That said, I don't think I'd be able to tell you that based on the fight alone. His hobbies consist of vomiting brown gunk, blasting lasers at you, flailing his arms like a madman, and jumping. So he doesn't exactly strike me as the sentimental type, but what would I know? I do think it's a cool fight though. He's got some nice flashy moves and some cool arm rip-offing, a la The Last Giant. The best way to fight him is just lurk behind his back to bait the jump, charge an attack, and then unleash a heavy blow on his head which for some reason always lands right in front of your weapon. Do this enough times and he bites the dust. It sounds sorta of lame, but I think that even with this glaring oversight it's still a good time. He also looks pretty cool, and seeing him all over the cathedral ward after killing Rom was definitely a neat reveal.
I love that name. Suffixes and added surnames have always been of interest to me, and like Daughter of the Cosmos is just so awesome. Lore wise, this is because she's essentially the god of the healing church. All members within it pray to her as she's one of the last residing relatives of the Eldritch Great Ones. And as awesome as it sounds to be worshipped by a bunch of globhead aliens, this fight is remarkably sad. At first, she doesn't even want to fight. You have to hit her enough to anger her, but a good heads up that 100% of bosses who have this feature are in the top 3 of their respective DLC or main game in terms of difficulty. And this mechanic barely matters. I bet basically nobody without previous knowledge or experience has beat her on their first try. This is thanks to her odd design, consisting of a tentacle body, a fungi infected half split open damage sponge, and teeny tiny bird wings that are the biggest challenge in this fight. Said wings enable her to pull off one attack in specific, the charge. It has basically no tells unless you're going for her head, and tends to happen an awful lot when you do the normal strategy of sticking to the butt. Like I said earlier, her head's a damage sponge, and for the oddball cannon or longsword build, this fight is over in close to 30 seconds, but for the saw cleaver or hunter axe, for best effects, stay a bit away from her body, but in front, and it'll bait the head smash, which gives ample time for hits. I've actually never been able to pull this off, mainly because her AI can be a bit inconsistent with head attacks, but for the most part, it is a viable strategy. You'll also be given a ton of time for headshots during the mid-fight phase transition. Phase 1 isn't too bad, like I said it's just the charge and a couple swipes here and there, but phase 2 is when things get down to business. She gains frenzy inducing blood aoes and spit attacks, intense flying slams, and of course a call beyond, which by the way this has to be like the 8th boss with this move. And considering that, you guessed it, it is a hunter killer, you have to be high stamina so you can run as fast as you can to not die from this thing, but at least this time the arena is super wide so you have a much better chance of surviving. The frenzy can be a bit annoying, especially when piled on top of her unending barrage of charges, but evidently it's doable and arguably a necessary addition considering how easily you can bait her into head slams for viscerals. As one of the coolest looking and best lore bosses in the game, I appreciate Abritas a good amount. Of all the opening boss cutscenes, I think this one is one of the coolest and most gnarly. The idea of feeling yourself turn into a big dog creature sounds pretty damn uncomfortable, so I gotta feel sorry for the poor girl and all those snapping bones of hers. My sympathy is a little tapered though, since if I'm gonna be honest I still find this fight sorta hard. She's pretty tanky and is great at catching mindless or hasty dodges, which can result in some embarrassing deaths and the run up is rather lengthy to get back. While similar in stature to the cleric beast, she's not at all meant to be fought like him. You can't just hug her sides and back since she has some pretty solid ways of hurting you back there that you really don't want to get caught up in. It's also pretty hard to see what she's gearing up to do with all those bandages or hair or whatever blocking your view. It is nice that you can stagger her limbs for some stuns since it gives a much needed reprieve from her rampage. She's got range that isn't to be underestimated either, those limbs of hers are a lot lankier than they look. I'd say it's a solid beast fight, but I'd have given her a less bulky health bar personally. Yeah, I dig Daughter of the Cosmos, I do not like Wet Nurse. That name sounds so musty, man. Like, Wet Nurse? Ugh. Name aside, when it comes to this moist caregiver, unique is an understatement. Throughout the fight, there's this annoying ass baby that doesn't stop crying until around 45 seconds after the fight's over, not to mention it was crying during the entirety of the Nightmare of Mensis. I don't blame the guy though, the old hag is creepy. It's a weird apparition type monster, it doesn't bleed when you hit it, it floats around, and it nightmare veils consistently, which specifically I'm here to vouch for. That mechanic is not only cool in my opinion, but very necessary considering how ridiculously easy she is as one of the last bosses of the main game. Which brings me to phase 1. Yeah, she basically does nothing, she has one attack that can actually harm you, that being a simple to dodge spinning swipe. Otherwise, she does this really long spam slash thing where she locks onto you in one direction, and even if you move, she just stays swinging in that direction. So it's literally a free couple of hits every time unless you're an idiot and figure to run into the one spot she stays swinging at. Of course, she has other moves all pretty typical though, like a slam, a flying lunge, or a normal lunge, so just press the circle button and you're good as gold. From time to time, she'll use a nightmare veil where the entire arena goes misty and you can only see from a limited visual distance. She uses this to her advantage and consistently pops in and out of hiding, but once again, she's so slow that it doesn't really matter. There is a phase 2 though, uh, but there's not much to talk about. She gets more aggressive and during the Nightmare Veil, she clones herself a bunch, and it can get hectic if you don't know you can just run in circles around the whole arena and the veil will pass on. Still, it's a beautiful looking shot and it's unique in that regard. 
Surely disappointing as one of the final bosses of Bloodborne, the wet nurse is still a great time, plus is visually appealing, so a spot this high is well deserved. The first boss in the game for many, this guy serves as a beast hunting 101 guide. Using fire, unlocked rolling, and sticking close to the rear are some one size fits all strategies for beasts that this guy will drill into you pretty quick. I will say that he's no pushover and he takes many new players a good while to get the hang of. I gotta say I love his theme too, it's one of the most famous tracks to come out of Bloodborne and for good reason. I'd say that his main strength is he's just fun to fight. He's not insanely fast, so you can spend plenty of time laying into him, and seeing him keel over from limb damage is also really satisfying no matter how many times you've fought him. He's got pretty basic attacks, but as an introductory boss, that's pretty reasonable. He's also got that famous screech that basically everyone knows, which has got a counter bit in his favor too. Over time, I've fallen out of love with the Watchdog of the Old Lords. As a matter of fact, I had him in the top 10 of the entire series before my repeat playthrough, but I've come to realize he's just simply too easy to fully flesh out his moveset. I guess this is the best time to mention that we're not going to and haven't talked about the Defiled Bosses. For one, it's an optional chalice. Second, there's no difference besides your personal nerf, and third, it'd be unfair because the Defiled Watchdog is miles better than the others. So normally, the Watchdog is weak. He's a depth 1 chalice boss, so he's meant to be fought like before or directly after Rom. Due to this, he has basically no defense and his deflectory skin serves minimal purpose. However, it is a great mechanic for harder root versions of him. I do think it's cool how the skin's like a reverb of the limb mechanic. It's an outer shield that raises defense, but is breakable at the same time, and it's also split into sections with armor on his head, body, and limbs that offer multiple strategies to approach him. When it breaks, it causes him to stagger and the area affected takes nearly double the damage it did previous. And I've only talked about defense, offensively the watchdog has an awesome moveset. It really truly feels like a dog, or at least like a mutant lava dog, as it sticks to cool looking chomps and jumps. It also has dangerous, but fair not to mention awesome lava attacks like an AoE or a barf attack. Be extremely careful of your positioning throughout the whole fight, as these, along with the infamous charge attack, obliterate bad positioning. As unanimously one of the best Chalice Dungeon bosses, the watchdog gets placed out of the top 10 due to a lack of challenge and in turn a minimal moveset. Also, like totally forgot to mention, his theme is the best in the game. Papa G here is the first required boss, and he serves as a pretty heavy-handed welcome to Bloodborne moment. Most new players probably got obliterated by him for a while, made it to his second phase, and promptly panicked and died there too. He's one of many hunter type fights, all of which tend to rank pretty high in quality. The unique part is he turns into a beast at around 30% health, a surprising and creative twist to make it stand out more and get the player used to faster combat. And also, he teaches you not to dodge backwards all the time. That does not work here at all. I think this phase is best strafed around. He's pretty quick and spazzy, but not enough to feel unfair or anything. Molotov's also put a sizable dent in his health bar in phase 2, and I like to see items actually be useful in a Souls game for once. Even early on, firebombs are pretty useless, so I'm glad Bloodborne made throwables not worthless garbage for a change. Gascoigne has yet another unique mechanic in the music box. You can talk to his daughter, who offers it to you as a way to make him regain his sanity and return home. He's far enough gone for that not to work out, but you can stun him by using it up to three times in a fight. I never really use it since I don't like to fight dirty, but it is a neat touch. A tad unrelated, but another fun fact is the music box affects some other bosses too, strangely enough. It can make Rom stop moving and make Murgo's wet nurse stagger backwards. So that's neat info. Overall, Gascoigne is an amazing introductory boss who is well deserving of his frequent praise. Like I said earlier, I wouldn't have a lot to say here. The Bloodletting Beast is the headless Bloodletting Beast minus the crap that landed the headless version in the bottom 10. On the other hand, this version, with a head and stuff, lands itself in the top 10 thanks to perfect scaling. 
For a depth 3 boss, it stands out as heavy in HP and highly damaging, but due to its weakish defense and fair movesets and tells, it's extremely balanced. The Earthquake feels a lot easier to dodge is one thing, and second, he's not nearly as punishing for a mistimed roll or the works. I enjoy this guy especially because the previous three bosses, <clears throat> in order, Merciless Watchers, Undead Giant, and Rom. So that definitely helps, but either way, he's fair and above all enjoyable. This fight is a pleasant surprise. I've done the Chalice Dungeons to completion twice over, and I remember disliking this fight the first time around. Upon fighting her again, I can't imagine for the life of me why I hated this fight so much. It's actually pretty damn fair. A big mechanic is the baby crying, which is to tell to back up or else you'll be temporarily paralyzed. This mechanic is a good way to force the player off her so they don't just R1 spam her to death, while not also being unavoidable BS. Even if she does hit you with it, which happened to me a fair deal, she's not even guaranteed a free hit and you can still escape unharmed. She's got flashy looking cool blood attacks and can clone herself for added mayhem, although one bullet will put the phonies down with ease. You really have a lot of freedom in how you tackle this fight, which is something I'm a big fan of. And while the buildup of the Chalice Dungeons was horrendous, they at least had the decency to make the payoff solid. I think the entire top 10 keep flaws to a minimum, but from here on out I have no overarching negatives in mind for anyone left. I'll get nitpicky and say the Elder should have more health. That's it. So with the negatives out of the way, this guy has my favorite boss weapon in this series. Or rather, weapons. At first glance, it's a plain old staff, but the Royal Elder of the Thumerian line has a few tricks up his sleeve. Through Pyromancy, he can transform the staff into a crossbow, scythe, mace, sickle, lance, spear, or keep it as the staff which in itself has Pyromancy. All attacks are fire based and each weapon has a unique move. For me personally, the most preferable weapons are the lance and the spear. These give wide openings for hits due to easily dodged charge attacks, whereas weapons like the scythes are too quick for reliable damage output. The crossbow is definitely my favorite though, he uses it to check you while you're at distance and I mainly like it because it just looks awesome. As one of the final chalice bosses, he's no disappointment, if anything he exceeds the previous Thumerians and stands out as quite the unique boss fight. This is Bloodborne's obligatory offering to the renowned FromSoft gank boss catalog, and fortunately it was very well done here. All three of the shadows have unique movesets, and unlike the Cave of the Dead gank in Souls 2, these guys were worth going the extra mile for. It's balanced very well between melee, caster, and a hybrid, and it makes a demand for some well thought out strategy, which is refreshing. The arena is great too, the grave in the middle is super useful for crowd control, and this fight would probably be like halfway down the list if not for this structure being here. It's worth noting that they are parryable, which is also a big help. This stuff is all pretty great, but they also made a second phase for once one of them gets low, which is just amazing. All three of them suddenly get snake faces and start using more bizarre attacks and become more powerful. This phase is the real deal. It's pretty tricky and you gotta watch your footing. They start breaking out the Madras whistle, one of the most irritating attacks in the game, and things get hairy. That thing is like impossible to dodge and does a serious number on your health. If they start spamming it like they did for me, you're in big trouble. I barely came out of my fight here alive, it took every last vial out of me. Normally I'd have been annoyed, but the adrenaline from that fight is so powerful that I didn't even really mind, which is a sign that FromSoft did their job well with the mysterious Grave Guarders. Remember how earlier I was saying the Witch's objective difficulty opinion didn't match mine? Well, the same goes for Ligarius, except for me, he's really easy. I remember all the way back in like 8th or 9th grade during my first Bloodborne playthrough and Alex wouldn't stop talking about how crazy hard Marta Ligarius was, then after a good platter of chicken nuggies and Horizon chocolate milk, I beat the guy with relatively no damage taken. And ever since, it's been the same for me, I simply don't find him hard. Don't think that takes anything away from him however, as he's one of the best and most unique bosses in the series and for that, I appreciate him. You know the drill by this point, the fight has two phases with the first noticeably easier than the second. Well, before we get to that, I want to mention two things. One, his cutscene is probably my favorite or tied for my favorite in the series with Father Ariandel. In general, it's just eerie watching like human mummies spring back to life. Which also leads me to my second point, the lore. At one point, Ligarius was the head of the Executioners, a fanatical slash dogmatic sect of the Healing Church. Their sole goal was to completely obliterate the Kanehurst family for their use of blood arts. 
Upon his escapade of Castle Kanehurst, which by the way is one of the most beautiful run-ups to a boss in the series, Ligarius wandered upon a quote-unquote vile secret, that being the crown of illusions in Vile Blood Throne, that he then swore his life to protect by placing the crown upon his head, preventing anyone else from uncovering it. So really, this guy isn't even bad, he's just protecting what's close to him and if anything nobly guarding a horrific piece of history from the average traveler or person. Anyways, if you can't tell, the fight is also pretty damn cool. Phase 1 is totally a magic based fight, Ligarius has an ancient staff that has a multitude of badass skull resembling magic attacks that all feature intertwined swings that if too close you can get hit by. At around 60% health he'll get enraged and kickstart phase 2. For the rest of the fight, he's close to double as aggressive as he was in the first half and by this point he'll begin to use his sword. The sword is arguably the most dangerous component of the fight, it's extremely quick and after each swing leaves a volatile after effect that can rack up huge damage if not cared for. He also gains an entirely new moveset with unique and engaging attacks like Sword Rain, but he's also much more parryable. To counter this, on certain attacks over random intervals, his sword will flash bright red before the swing to notify the player he can't be parried. This is the rare mechanic that not only benefits the hunter, but also the boss. It prevents you from unknowingly countering a normal looking attack only to get obliterated with counter damage while also preventing Ligarius from being parry cheesed. As close to perfect as it gets, Martyr Logarius is a legendary boss battle, but sadly has too little health and impact to survive in the top 5. Hell yeah. Of all the classic, sad final bosses in FromSoft games, this one is for sure the best. He's an actual character you've interacted with, which is a rarity in Souls games, adding to the weight of the encounter pretty mightily. And the fact that Garmin only fights you because he wants the best for the hunter and knows the hunter will become a slave to the moon presence if he wins makes it even more depressing. It's got a great soundtrack backing it up that fits really well, while also having a bit of the epic feeling I felt the other final boss themes lacked until this point. The arena is gorgeous and really well designed. I like that it's a slope, which doesn't affect the gameplay much, but it's some good variation in terrain. It's also just neat seeing what's beyond that gate that's been locked the entire game's duration until now. He's deceptively fast for an old timer, and while he is parryable, I would not call him a pushover by any means. I was unable to beat him at blood level 4, and considering I first tried to breed us and almost got Ludwig, that's a pretty solid resume. Like, I never even got him close to defeat. He's hard to dodge and hits pretty freaking hard. His second phase animation lets you get a backstab in, and then he's really out for blood. His church pick is a versatile weapon which paired with his blunderbuss can really do some work. And his added phase 2 powers like the AoE, he becomes a serious force to be reckoned with after that. At least you know that by killing him in the hunter's dream he is finally freed from his nightmare and able to live in peace in Yarnum, or at least die and get some well deserved rest. Godspeed old man. I don't think a single person could have seen this coming. Like, it's no blue smelter demon, but this is a Cinderella story. The Abhorrent Beast is not only far and away the best Chalice boss, he's also the best beast in the game. Where others fell short in proper but fair attack windows, combos, health, scaling, and iframes, the Abhorrent Beast checks out. I can't think of any boss in the series who rivals him in terms of the intensity to fairness ratio. His combos feel long and powerful, but basically every swing provides a fair window to dodge and reprieve. Also, I haven't mentioned it much, or even at all this video, but rallying feels much easier on this guy than most bosses. His moveset is mainly fast swings and such, but what really separates him from me are the miscellaneous ones like the tornado, for no real reason other than they're super fun and look badass. And this is more of an out of sorts fact, but he actually has 3 phases with each one increasing in the number of follow ups and attacks in his moveset. Otherwise, I really don't have a lot to say about the Abhorrent Beast, he's just one hell of a good time and in my opinion has the perfect level of speed meant for this game. Poor old Baldi here is best known for two things, his difficulty and his screaming. Both are not without good reason, he is the game's finale so to speak, so he should be its greatest challenge, and he did just crawl out of his dead mother's womb, so it makes sense he'd be a little nuts when he worms his way out of her guts. I do think they nailed the sounds this guy makes. The crying he does in the intro has a really distinct wail, and I think it's pretty well done. A few other neat things I learned is that Koss herself has an almost human face at the end facing away from the fog gate, which I never actually knew until I read it online. I could never really make heads or tails of what Koss was for a while, just looked like a big fish slug or something to me. 
I also heard that the reason the Orphan can summon lightning is because he's calling upon Koss herself, who still exists just without a living physical form. It's why when he does that attack, the lightning always strikes the corpse of Koss as a beacon and then shoots out from there. He definitely has a cool moveset. He's spazzy in a good way, I'd say. And that he doesn't make the camera freak out on you because he's not always running circles around you, as much as he is dashing towards you and strafing wildly. He's got some cool yo-yo type moves with his mother's placenta that take a bit of practice to learn but are ultimately pretty fair and punishable. Phase 1 is tricky but not unmanageable overall. Phase 2 is when stuff gets super hard. He starts two-handing his big shrimp, leaping all over the place, slinging crap at you and screaming like a jump-scared Five Nights at Freddy's YouTuber. I found the best move here is parrying him, which with 50 skill like I had can do crazy damage. This fight is visually stunning with one of the coolest, most original arenas in the series, and a great background in the fishing hamlet. Fair engaging difficulty, cool lore, and awesome design make this fight one of the best in the series hands down. I know for a fact we're gonna get a whole lot of doo-doo in the comments for not putting Sakushi Lady Maria at the number one spot. To be honest, it's only because Ludwig is the best fight in the series in both our opinions, so there's no real way of topping the top, if that makes sense. But Lady Maria is a close third in my book. The Demon Princes are just so damn awesome too. But hey, third out of like 140 bosses is no small feat. Before I get too deep in the fight, let's preface by saying Lady Maria is the ultimate sad arc boss. While a student of Garamin, her master developed an obsession over her to the point where he made the doll to replicate her, among other unconfirmed purposes. She despised blood arts even as a Kanehurst and preferred using a Rakuyo, or rather in general dexterity and skill over shameful and disgraceful blood arts. And like everyone else in the Hunter's Nightmare, she was sent there permanently after attempting to harvest Mother Koss's body for her blood, which now that I write it sounds contradictory. Either way, up to that point when you enter the room, she sits atop the astral clock tower and watches over the fishing hamlet, or used to watch because she's dead. But there's something fishy about you and it causes her to spring back to life. Then the fight begins, and it's really beautiful. The entire thing is best handled by parrying, but the first phase in specific stands out as obviously easy to visceral through in a short manner of time. This early on, she doesn't do anything special, just the Rakuya, both transformed and untransformed, and a pistol that can parry you as well. For her first phase, the attack pool is extremely varied, and each attack in specific has unique and discernible animations. Come phase 2, you'll notice the longer the fight goes on, the deeper she plunges into madness. Like, literally, she stabs herself to gain blood arts, which was sadly reminiscent of Artorias. What I mean is that she's a legendary and noble warrior whose goal in life is a good cause, but for the sake of victory, she drops all her morals and code. And it's fair, there's just something heart-wrenching about watching a fallen hero lose sanity. No matter which way you look at it though, each phase basically adds on new components to already existing moves, along with new attacks as well. The second phase gives a blood trail after effect that majorly buffs her damage and she drops the pistol. From here on out, she only uses the transform Rakuyo. All of her moves are poetic yet chaotic and are real eye candy, plus her increased aggression gives the fight much more intensity. The final phase is exactly what you'd want. She gains fire on top of the blood and is extremely powerful. In trend, her health is low, especially in comparison to the other bosses of the DLC, but the visuals, musical piece, and overall atmosphere are unmatched by everybody else except our unanimous number one. This fight is just awesome in every sense of the word. It's completely fair, flashy, lore heavy, has the best theme in the entire series in my opinion, and lots of variation. Not to mention, I think Ludwig gets me the most hyped of any boss in this series. Since Ludwig pulled it off first, many amazing fights since have used the midway cutscene technique, but I think none of them landed quite as well as this one. The transition between the frantic, manic first phase to the composed and professional second phase is really dramatic and cool. Not to mention the goddamn Moonlight Greatsword makes its routine appearance here, which adds to the excitement even more. The only change I would make personally is to give each phase its own health bar, since it would have been the first fake out boss death before Souls 3 spammed it, so I think it would have had a lot of impact and shocked people in a really good way. I think the arena kicks ass too. It's literally called the Undead Corpse Pile. Like, that's awesome. It's a bunch of bloody corpses in a dark room where the entire floor is just spilled blood. I love it. And the intro cutscene is pretty well written. It's not often I get to talk about it, since Soul's boss cutscenes rarely have dialogue, but I like the word choice of unsightly beast and a great terror looms and stuff. Really builds a sense of dread, which is paid off well when the ugly son of a bitch walks into view. His design is just so detailed, the fusion with his horse and his hollow neck full of eyes is so gruesome. 
and I love that his next stump can shoot mystery gunk at you. That attack is neat. I always thought Bloodborne needed more lasers. Phase 2's attacks are even more crazy. He gets arcane glowing energy blasts, his huge sword, and some serious speed. While Phase 2 is easier, I'd say, it's still pretty engaging. I do wish he didn't stagger, though. It makes the fight feel a bit too easy for me, and if there was ever a boss I wanted to spend more time on, it's this one. It's safe to say this is my favorite boss in the entire series, and FromSoft absolutely nailed the intro to the old Hunter's DLC. And being able to talk to him after the fight is also a really nice touch. It's neat conversing with the guy after doing a number on him. I usually just tell him the church hunters were honorable Spartans to put his mind at ease and let him die peacefully. The guy deserves it, as well as the number one spot on our list. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you all enjoyed. Our next video is a ranking of all the bosses in Dark Souls 3, the finale of our FromSoft boss rankings since we both don't like Sekiro. As always, please like and subscribe and we hope to see you next time. Deuces.